Hi, my name is Alex, and I would like to talk to you about KTCP, an in-kernel split TCP proxy. Uh, this talk is partitioned into three steps. First, I will provide additional background in context to KTCP. Next, I will cover the feature we've added to KTCP in order to improve TCP performance. And finally, I will talk about uh, the specifics of KTCP implementation and how we attempt to squeeze the most of each CPU cycle. KDCP was built as part of the Buffery project, an innovation program under the Veeamer Office of the CTO, specifically under Veeamer Research. In Project Pathway, we were exploring ways to improve the mid mile performance of SD1 servers. For those of you who may not know, uh, SD1 or software defined wide area networks is a way to connect multi site clients reliably. This comes to uh, this comes as a replacement to the costly and inflexible MPLS. Now, the basic insight of Project Pathway is there are better infrastructure alternatives to the public internet, which often serves as a meat map. Each of the big free clouds have their own globe-spanning network infrastructure. That's AWS, GCP, and Azure. And it's possible to connect remote regions almost exclusively on existing uh, cloud infrastructure. And that's exactly uh, what we did. We built a separate link health monitor uh, system. And we built a management system for deploying and management uh, over the networks. And we built KTCP, an in kernel uh, TCP slate proxy. Today, there are 73 regions around the globe, uh, not counting our cloud, uh, where we can bring up our software routers where we monitor the connection quality. In our experiments, we have seen that the biggest impact on TCP performance is gained by splitting TCP on every proxy. And in this talk, I will obviously focus on TCP split proxy and a detailed discussion regarding the uh, whole system you can be found in this uh, paper. So what is split TCP? Split TCP is a well-known technique for enhancing TCP connection. The procedure is, is simple. A single TCP connection is terminated on a proxy and two new TCP connections uh, are created. Each TCP connection is independent and may have uh, different configurations and uh, different congestion control, uh, different setups. Uh, so each has its own control loop and congestion control and that's completely separate. So why is it good? Uh, TCP modulates its behavior based on the acts it receives. A tighter control loops provide a better TCP experience. A shorter round trip time provides several benefits. Uh, faster uh, recovery from drops, a uh, faster ramp up of the speed, better throughput, a uh, better throughput with smaller uh, buffers, and better competition with other small TP flows. Uh, let me share the link. We'll talk in greater detail how a split TCP works. Um, this is, was the backdrop for KTCP. Uh, and now I'll describe the high level uh, TCP optimization that we've uh, added, and then we'll go and look under the hood. For this discussion, we will need to dive deeper into TCP. And we will use this graph to show the flow of time and packets. The time flowing from top to bottom and packets going from left uh, to right and back. So in order to establish a TCP connection, three packets uh, must be exchanged. Namely, a scene packet from the client, a scene arc from the server, and finally, a client arc and any possible uh, payload uh, going back to the server. This is known as a TCP freeway engine. And for example, establishing a TCP connection between San Francisco and Bangalore takes about 411 milliseconds. And it takes more than 500 milliseconds uh, for the first bytes of the response to actually arrive. This time between when the connection was initiated and till the first bytes of the reply arrive is called time to first byte and actually corresponds to the 
response of the, of the site that you're visiting. Half a second is, is a lot. Now, TCP uh, is by design uh, trying to be nice to other flows and builds up its speed slowly. And that's called TCP slow, slow stuff. This dimming behavior uh, really impacts download time. And with greater distances, it effect compounds. In this example, the payload is three times the size of the initial send window. And so the arc from the client must travel all the way back to Bangalore before the rest of the payload is sent. So in our example, it will take almost a second to get all three packets of the response to arrive. So you, you see what kind of issues we're trying to deal with. And when trying to resolve uh, bottlenecks and introduce improvements, it good, it's, it's good to, just to understand the theoretical limit of uh, what you can achieve. Suppose we were limited only by the speed of light in copper. In this case, ideally, we would like to see the request going out and the packets of response arriving altogether all just under 300 milliseconds, 274. And this would correspond to a 2x improvement in the time to first byte and 3x improvement in download time. Next, I will show how we right, attempt to reach that. So in this experiment, we added uh, two cloud gateways, one in Oregon, close to the client, and one in Mumbai, close to the server. We determined the CP connection on each hop. So now we have uh, three TCP handshakes, each with smaller RTT, but the sum of the RTTs is the same as before, so the uh, time to establish them is unchanged. Uh, but now when the server sends its payload, uh, the act from Mumbai uh, is much faster to, to go back to Bangalore. And it's the server is able to ramp up its speeds faster and already send the packets it needs to send even before the initial bytes arrive back at San Francisco. This simple TCP split improves uh, the download time by 60 milliseconds. And that's even before we do anything uh, fancy with our code, just by TCP splitting on two hops. Uh, what we can uh, do to improve the TCP connection is start with the TCP uh, freeway handshakes. So there is no reason to create the handshakes sequentially. The limitation is only in the socket API uh, that the process that invoke except will return only when the handshake is complete. There's no reason for, for our code to you know, suffer from the, from the consequences. So we've added Netflix filter hooks to capture incoming scene packets. And now, when a new scene packet uh, arrives, we immediately begin the connection with the next gateway. And the, and the handshakes happen concurrently. This happens on both gateways. In this case, time to first byte uh, will be shorter. And uh, by doing current, current handshakes, we were able to save about six, another 60 milliseconds from download time and uh, the time to first byte. Now, the important thing to notice uh, is that while the number of uh, possible endpoints like San Francisco and Bangalore is quite large, the number of locations where we can uh, bring up a gateway is, is fairly limited, uh, 73 in our case. What that means is that between each gateway that we control, we can establish a connection preemptively. Uh, those, this connection is in, independent of the other two sides that connect to the endpoints. So they can be between uh, San Jose in Oregon, Mumbai, Bangalore, or any other uh, configuration. So in this scenario, there's already a connection uh, between Oregon and Mumbai. It's actually a pool of connections, uh, but for this example, we need only one. So, when the SYN packets arrives in this uh, case, the existing connection is allocated from pool of connections and the SYN itself uh, is forwarded to Mumbai as payload. 
and initiates the next uh, the freeway handshake from Mumbai to Bangalore. Now, when the HTTP request uh, arrives at the organ gray, it is immediately sent to Mumbai as the connection is already established. And the full uh, payload uh, still needs to wait for the uh, arc between organ and Mumbai to arrive. But the time to first buy now is 302 milliseconds and download time is at 500 milliseconds. So by avoiding the long handshake, we were able to shave off about 200 additional milliseconds from both the time to first byte and download time. Now, let us consider the fact that the pre-connection that we've established is over the cloud infrastructure and not the public internet. We know that the channel is wide. The, the, the cloud providers invest uh, millions of, uh, billions of dollars each year to improve this infrastructure. And in addition, this cloud provider needs to provide some benefit guarantees to its clients. And all it has a mechanism to make sure that the resources are shared fairly. That means that we can uh, set the initial to CP send window to a much higher point because we are not afraid uh, to hinder other uh, TCP connections. So by effectively eliminating slow start over the long middle connection, a more payload can go out immediately. So in this case, it happens the same as before. A pre-connection is allocated. The ARC from Oregon goes back to Mumbai but the thing is that the uh, Mumbai server doesn't actually need to wait to wait for the act to arrive because the uh, send window is large enough. And now we shave another 150 milliseconds from the download time. And this is probably as close as uh, we can get uh, to the uh, limit set by the speed of light. Uh, of course, by moving the uh, gateways Orang and Mumbai even closer to the endpoints, we can improve better, improve even more and, uh, and gain as much performance as we need. So we got the 2x performance in time to, uh, to first byte and almost the x3 performance gain in the download time. And this is the results of an experiment of a 50 megabyte download. Uh, here, end-to-end -end means the download was done over the internet. Baseline means that uh, the download was done with just standard uh, TCP splitting, and KTCP is just the whole uh, package at once. And what we see it uh, on the left is that the time to first byte with the baseline is actually a, a bit larger because uh, the path, uh, the detours to Oregon and by actually at an uh, several milliseconds. But overall, the download time is much faster, both in, in the baseline and, and KTCP. So now that I've showed you why we do KTCP and what kind of performance you can get over the, uh, the long connections, let's talk about the KTCP implementation. Let's drill down. So why the kernel? We built TCP split as a Linux kernel model, and we do, and we chose to do it this way because the interaction with the network happens in the kernel. And all the tail, uh, tools that we need to build a proxy are in the prox in the kernel uh, as well. I've already mentioned that we use NetFilter to capture scene packets, and the user space has uh, expensive context switches, expensive. Uh, system calls, and worst of all, expensive copy. So for our use case, it's uh, slow and limited. Other user space uh, solutions like DDK and MAP uh, or NetMap are no better as we would have to build our own network uh, infrastructure uh, all on our own. I will address alternative solutions uh, at the end of the, of the talk. The basic data structure that is used to manage a split connection is called a connection QP. It's a misleading misnomer, I admit. Uh, 
but each QP is identified by its a TCP four tuple. So we have five tuple. TCP is one of them. It's a protocol, so we have the four tuple, namely the source, destination, port IP, which provides us with a twelve byte key. Uh, we have two TCP sockets, one RX and TX. Uh, we're both obviously can send and receive, but the idea is that the client facing socket is called the RX and the server facing is called the TX. Uh, additionally, we have a ref count to facilitate an early teardown of the QP, an RB node and a wait queue. Uh, they're used for initialization. When the connection is established, two kernel threads are forwarding the information between the actual bytes within the RX and TX sockets. Each thread is receiving on uh, one socket and sending to the other. Uh, both send and receive in a blocking fas uh, fashion, which implicitly creates a back pressure when needed. And when you have one side a cloud gateway and the other is a public internet, you often need it. Now, I'll, the Kube creation has a four step. On scene, a thread is scheduled to run and its job is to set up the server side TCP connection, uh, pre-existing or, or new, so either way. When the client side connection is complete, a second thread is scheduled and its job to manage the client side TCP connections. And both have a CPU mask uh, with one bit set to a core that is set by a simple hash of the fourth tuple. Both try to modify and create a the QP into a QP in a local QP tree on that specific core. And when the complete QP exists, uh, both thread get a full CPU mask and start shuffling bytes uh, as the scheduler uh, deems. Now let's show a demonstration how it will work. A natural uh, uh, callback is invoked on core zero. It's a rail and scene packet, so an a thread is allocated to handle uh, the scene packet. What it does, it creates a connection with the server. And it's scheduled to run on uh, CPU2, on core 2, due to the five tuple hash. Now, the scene handler uh, adds its QP to the local uh, arbitrary and waits for the receive uh, socket, namely the client side socket to uh, edit this information. At the same time, well, while we wait, the proxy server uh, accepts the connection from the, the source. Now the freeway handshake is complete. A new copy is allocated, and a new thread is allocated and scheduled to run on, on uh, core two. So the connection uh, starts on, on core two, finds the QP in the QP tree, sees that the, there is a QP with the four tuple or the 12 byte a key all in there. It removes it from the key, from the tree, wakes up the waiting peer. Well, obviously after uh, uh, updating the uh, second socket and starts forwarding uh, bytes from uh, RX to TX while the other does the other way. And after it's the, this handshake between the two threads, they're free to move around uh, as they wish on the machine. Kernel threads are great. They provide a process context that allows you to sleep and allows you to get a fair timeshare as it's something that it, the OS scheduler does. The caller provides a function context a function and a context that gets uh, used by the function and the caller gets the uh, thread context in struct form. The problem of that API is that the calls are slow. It may, the, the outliers may take several uh, milliseconds. It was really uh, tangible in, the, in our experience where the variance in the, re the results was, uh, was quite, quite large. And the greatest issue is that the fact that we can't really call this API in the NAPI context where we need it, as I've demonstrated in the previous slides. So in order to solve this problem, we created a pool of threads. 
Let's talk about that. So we create a pool of pre-allocated -alloc pre and reusable kernel threads that can execute arbitrary functions set at runtime rather than on creation time. Each pool element has a task struct, a callback pointer, uh, and the data. Now, the third function itself that we called initially uh, to create the thread, the original kernel thread, is, is quite simple. What it does, it runs in an endless loop, it, running this callback, and when it's done, it just goes back to sleep. It's obviously used its own data that can be modified in, in random as well. Now, this system is fast. You just schedule, you don't need to allocate anything. And you can run it from anywhere. So both so, uh, problems are solved. One last thing I wanted to mention is the, we have two pools here from connection pools and thread pools. And the thing is that per core uh, caches are, well, suck. And there was a solution proposed 20 years ago in an ATC paper in 2001. The basic idea is called magazines, which provide actually two per core caches, each of limited size, and you have two to avoid thrashing. So, so let's see how it works. We, we look at, see it at core two for this example, and we'll try to remove two elements from the, from, from the cache. So we element one, we get just one element, then, then it's empty. Now, when the core has two empty uh, magazines, what it does, it now accesses the global uh, pool and replenishes uh, by receiving a full uh, magazine instead of an empty one. So in this animation, the, full, uh, um, the empty magazine also joined the empty magazine uh, list. This provides with very good performance uh, with at high rates. So it's an unfortunate that it's not part of the, of the Linux kernel today. Uh, and now let's go talk about zero copy. My main issue with user space was that the copy costs. But the thing that I did not mention is that the kernel socket API also performs a uh, copy. Some modifications uh, were needed to, uh, well, allow zero copy as it's much more simple to do in, in, in kernel space. So there is also already infrastructure in place for, uh, for reading uh, with a zero copy. It's called the spirit sock and it's used by Splice and the 4K user space zero copy efforts. What it needs, it needs a, your own, a, well, it's called an actor on this API, your own callback that just collates the packets from the, from the, the fragments from the SKBs. On TX, it's actually simpler or, or looks like it's simpler as there are two options. One and do TCP send patches, and which is used also in Splice. And it's a, also a misnomer because ironically, TCP send pages only accepts one page to send. Uh, unlike uh, the second option, TCP send messages locked, where there is already code for uh, the message zero copy efforts uh, that allow zero copying for user space. So by well, breaking the changes that were made and removing the uh, user space support, we were able to get TCP send message to work with kernel buffers as well with zero copy uh, settings. Let's see the evaluation hours. So we ran our evaluation of a, a virtual environment on the Google Cloud. For our testing, we created 16 core Intel Cascade Lake high frequent VAs, each capable of three, uh, 32 gigabits of egress bandwidth and each with 64 uh, gigabytes of RAM. In the first uh, experiment, we wanted to evaluate the cost of data sent. We created three processes that were attempted to patch as much bytes as possible on a single core, 64 kilobytes at a time, just to minimize the impact of the system calls on the results. And we see that the number of cycles spent per byte on average, that's the, uh, that's the metrics I, I like best to 
show the uh, efficiency of, of uh, each solution. Now, what we see here is message zero copy compared to KTCP with the zero copy uh, fixes, KTCP without the zero copy fixes, and send page. And all the flows are reach about 27 gigab gigabytes per second, but the KTCP solution that is stuck at about 19 gigabits per second and spending about 50% of its cycle on copying. Message zero copy was spending about third of its cycles on get users page, pages fast, which doesn't seem that fast in this context. And it confirms the original uh, numbers reported in the, in the original NetDev conference. Somewhat surprisingly, send page also had lots of redundant overheads. About 90% of its cycle were uh, spent on generic file uh, splice read. So just doing zero copy sends in the kernel is, is, uh, is much faster. We also uh, run a similar experiment for splicing performance uh, with free GCP VMs. Uh, the main C thing we see here is there are a lot of uh, evaluation here is that all the, the copying uh, solutions are much more expensive than the zero copying solutions. And we see here that KTCP versus KTCP zero is, well, it's more than two times uh, faster uh, when you add zero copy. Uh, the other two that interest are SOCMAP and SPLICE. Uh, well, SOCMAP, as I've mentioned, uh, doesn't have a back pressure, which is important in, in our case. And SPLICE is actually a user space uh, system call with sometimes a lot of overheads and uh, would, those that we would rather avoid. So for more details about the various splicing techniques, I can uh, recommend this to a blog post by Mark at Cloudflare. Uh, if you need to reach out, this is my email and the code is available uh, at my GitHub at ktcp.git. Thank you. Okay, uh, thank you. So we do have um, a number of questions. Uh, I'd like to kick it off. I, I don't know if this was a question from Eric, um, but uh, he mentioned a couple of things, which were more points. Uh, let's hope middle boxes will be maintained up to date. Um, is that in reference to anything special with regards to KTCP? Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, so uh, I guess the question of is about splitting, you know, having splitting points uh, along the path. You install a software one day and then this software can last for years and maybe this software will not be updated if some bug needs to be fixed. And so things like new TCP, things like TCP fast open had to suffer uh, some kind of deployment issue because some middle books were like set in stone, like uh, the software was never updated. And so the, and so this fast open uh, requests were completely denied. So I might've missed this, but is this um, a form of proxy or are we doing some, uh, some sort of transparent in in network uh, TCP translation. It, it's transparent. Uh, transparent in the sense that we use uh, uh, it's well. Let me correct myself. It's not uh, transparent. You have TCP sockets and you have TCP termination on each uh, on each node. And the middle boxes are actually VMs that can be replaced. And uh, you can uh, well, it's not mentioned in the talk because it's not part of the talk. But you can uh, do load balancing and redirect the, the new connections to new boxes and uh, uh, update uh, the machines with new code uh, incrementally. So it's not actually a problem. I'm answering to the what I assume was the question by Eric. Um, okay, so, so as far as the network is concerned, these are just TCP packets going to uh, a destination address yeah. that happens to be somewhere in the network? Yeah. Okay, so along those lines, I think uh, a good follow-up is, 
uh, is this capable of converting TCP to um, multipath TCP? Uh, there is no limitation to what you can do. So you have, a, on, on the one hand, you terminate the connection from, from the client. And what you do to, to, to make the data available on the other side is, is fully up to you. You want to use UDP transport? Go ahead. So what, what's implemented today is that I open a second TCP socket and send the, uh, the data for it. But there, there was talk about implement whatever is best for that specific uh, destination. It can be, I don't know, an InfiniBand uh, infrastructure on the left hand. So you open real InfiniBand qubits. And uh, so, you know, whatever you need. Okay, and I assume that's going to extend to the question about quick. So quick could be on one side, and that could be converted to TCP on the other. Quick is an issue because QI is fully its headers are fully encrypted. So unlike TCP, which I can open, the, I, I can terminate the connection in the, in the mid box. It's not something I can do for quick. Quick is end to end. Well, but, but that he, also assumes in the case of TCP, there's no TCP authentication header. And TLS is, goes above us, so. Well, TLS yeah. is, but but we could also um, encrypt the TCP header. So yes. So I always wondered this: how, how do we how do we implement quick proxies uh, because of this encrypted quick headers? Uh, well, is there uh, any ideas on that? Uh, you, you should ask the the quick guys. But uh, as far as I understand not being able to uh, split it, you know, do the same thing you did for TCP was part of the design of Quick, as, as far as I remember from the original Quick paper several years ago. They didn't want, especially because of what Eric asked, they mentioned those middle boxes that, you know, can, uh, well, I don't want to go into the Quick paper itself, but it was part of the design, as much as I understand. Please correct me if I'm wrong. Well, I mean, so there's an obvious issue, and it's not just here, but quick becomes more and more um, predominant traffic on the internet. Yeah. Uh, TCP only solutions become less and less valuable in some sense. Um, next question. So, is there any plan to implement these features in SockMap? So, SockMap, uh, I've answered in, in the chat. So, SockMap is an EPF implementation. And I think I've mentioned in the talk, uh, the problem with SockMap that you don't have explicit or implicit uh, back pressure, which is important for uh, where the, the two legs of the connection are not equal in, in bandwidth. Uh, so when the two, the two sides are equal, everything is great. But eBPF is a callback that happens in NAPI, so it, you don't really know who pays the, this, uh, the, the price for this callback, and you don't have back pressure. Namely, you, you can't uh, pause the sender on the left because the receiver on the right is not fast enough. So it's just not incompatible. So KTCP uses uh, kernel threads uh, exactly for this. So you can uh, time share. You can actually allow the kernel to, to do time sharing. You can do, uh, you can do traffic classes uh, this way. Uh, with uh, SockMap, it's, it's just a different implementation, you know, different approaches need to be, you know, taken. Short the answer, it's not compatible. So uh, I then ask, I think, I think this is a question, I'll try to interpret it. Um, what is the, the real use case for TCP, TCP splitting if both nodes are close to the server and close to the client? Um, it makes does it make sense to use a HTTP reverse, reverse proxy closer to the client? So uh, I guess generally what the question is, what, what is the best use case of this? When you have long, long connections. So if you have, it's not, there's no, uh, it's meaningless to use it in, in the same data center. Uh, you just waste uh, power. But if you have someone, a, a client and a server uh, in, on the East Coast, on, on, on the West Coast, that's where you can get you know, can see a uh, improved performance. The example I've shown, like uh, West Coast and uh, India, that's an incredible use case. Uh, so anyway, where you have a global or at least is U.S. spanning uh, entity that needs to connect its uh, pops, that would be a good use case.
Okay, so there were oh, uh, a few more one questions. One more option. If, you, if you're okay. in Europe, you can stream Netflix probably, you know, so if you're blocked via a, a, a USB. Just an option, if you're willing to pay. More of a joke. Okay. So I think uh, there were a few more questions on um, uh, the zero copy and the splicing, uh, but I think that's actually a pretty good segue into our next talk. So uh, let's go ahead and move on. Thank you very much. Um, that was very interesting.